Thank you for uh, being here today. And we have a really special guest today speaking. We have Eric Pelkey, and he's the her hereditary chief of the Swasun First Nation and the community engagement coordinator of the Wasanich Leadership Council. Eric, I'm so sorry, my accent will kill everything. So I apologize for how I will mention stuff. He was, uh, he, uh, he has worked in First Nation administrations for over 25 years, and he has had an incredible array of roles. He has been a band manager, a chief executive officer, a land manager, and a coordinator for the Sankofen Alliance, and I killed that, I'm sorry. He uh, has a degree in indigenous language revitalization from UVIC, and we are really, really grateful to have you here today. Thank you for coming and um, we will now let you speak. And um, if you want to specify some wording that I really killed, please go ahead. I will not be offended. I will be grateful to be corrected. Well, see, I guess uh, first off, I, I want to start off with a prayer that uh, the way that we always start off uh, with our gatherings, uh, because the Xenich people are, are very spiritual people. And uh, so that's that's always the, the proper way we feel to, to start things off. So I'll start off. I'd like to thank the Creator for bringing us this beautiful day. Ask the Creator to to lay a blessing on all of our communities and all our friends and families. Help guide them through these troubled times. Lay especially ask the Creator to lay a special blessing on our, our elders and our children and help to lay a special layer of protection onto them. Ask the Creator to help us lead us through the work that we need to do for our people. My uh, <clears throat> my traditional name is Kutchkinum. I am the hereditary chief of the Seot, Seot uh, village of the of the Sanich Nation. Uh, we have uh, uh, four four villages on the peninsula here: uh, Seot, Sarta, Pakatrin, and Saikum that are the, the existing villages, although there were many, many villages uh, around the peninsula that were, were taken away from us. And uh, a lot of the villages were, were decimated by the various uh, diseases that struck our people. <clears throat> so uh, I guess I wanted to start off by uh, by talking about uh, where you're at, because uh, I want to welcome you to, to the Sandwich Nation. Um, even though uh, you might not be here physically, uh, you're, you're here spiritually and uh, coming here to learn and hopefully work within, uh, within our territory. So uh, I'd like to welcome you all. <clears throat> I learned, uh, I, uh, well, I guess I grew up with uh, the, the story of the flood, of the flood as part of our creation story. Um, and it was, uh, it was uh, confirmed, uh, I guess, archeo archeologically through, uh, an acquaintance of mine that worked with Stantec. So around uh, 1995, I was called out to Salt Spring, Salt Spring Island, uh, which we know as Hwanenich. Hwanenich means looking towards Sanich. That's, that's the name of that place, Hwanenich. And, uh, uh, we have no no permanent residents on uh, on Hwanenich 
because uh, there is no access to water out there any longer because our reserve was uh, was uh, cut off from the, the water source when the reserve was created. So uh, all of our, our people were moved here to Sayout that used to live out there in, in Salt Spring. But uh, it is known as one of our oldest oldest villages there and stretched all, all the way down to the, around uh, Fulford Harbor. Some of our friends that we have out in uh, Salt Spring walk, walk the, the reserve that we have there and uh, can pretty regularly. And uh, when they find people uh, camping illegally or taking resources off the reserve, or they spot something that, that uh, might be troublesome to us, they, they phone us and let us know what's going on there. So in 1995, I was the, the band manager of Sayout and uh, I got a call from, from one of our friends out there telling us that there were remains on the beach in front of our, our old village. There was remains on the beach that had happened as a result of uh, erosion from the ocean. They called us uh, to come out there and uh, to, to do something about it and uh, before the tide washes it away. So uh, I took uh, four of our, our spiritual elders here and uh, two of our, our, our young men that deal with uh, the remains of our people. And uh, I guess I should point out that uh, there are only certain families that are allowed to handle remains of our ancestors. And they, they, it is passed down, passed down from father to son to grandson. So these people are the only ones that are, are permitted by our people to handle remains. So I, we brought two of them out with us, with the four spiritual elders, and uh, asked uh, an archaeologist from Stantec to, to join us to, to have a look at the, the possible age of the remains. So the, the archaeologist George came out there, and we, we, we were, found the remains. Uh, pretty quickly on the beach and uh, left the archaeologist to, to do her work. And uh, the only thing that she asked us to do was to bring bring a, a light, light colored blanket and uh, that we brought with us and uh, she laid it on the beach and then started uh, looking for, for the remains and uh, making sure that she got all of them. And what she did was she constructed the, constructed the skeleton of the person. Um, from all the remains, she constructed a full, full skeleton of, uh, of a man. And uh, by the, 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 the shape of the, the skull as a result of uh, cultural shaping, she could tell that uh, this was uh, what they are in, uh, in the olden days used to call a, a flathead person. It's a person that uh, they, when they were a child and they were there of uh, uh, a highborn lineage, they were, a board was uh, tied to their head to shape, to shape the front of their head. And uh, so the, when, they, when they became a man, their head, their forehead had appeared to be, to be flat, flat. And uh, so that uh, she said that uh, this was occurring probably about 5,000 years ago. 
and uh, she constructed it and showed us that there was just one one person, and that was a full. We found all of she found all of the bones, and constructed the constructed the the skeleton so that it was all there, and uh, nothing was missing. And so she found uh, various artifacts with it that uh, an axe head and a spear head an arrow head and uh, a lot of uh, bead, bead type uh, implements that uh, they must have, he must have had a, a beaded thing around his neck. So she found all those things and uh, all the, all the, the beads appeared to be made of, of bone of some kind, she said. So uh, that's why they lasted as long as they did. In the end, uh, in the end, um, finding that it was a, a full skeleton of a person, our our spiritual elders and uh, and the young men that handled the remains, I uh, gathered up the remains and and we brought it up up the bank, up the up the hill from the beach, and uh, reburied. We buried the individual and uh, the, the spiritual elders did a, a special prayer for them. Uh, they were not, uh, not uh, definitely sure which family it could, could come from. The, uh, so uh, they just blessed it as, as one of our people. <clears throat> All of the artifacts that were found on on the beach were buried with them because they felt that they were his his artifacts. After the burial, the 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 elders uh, told us that they had to go go pick uh, a special medicine and mix it, mix the medicine with with water, and. Uh, when they came back, they were going to use that to, to cleanse us, cleanse us all, all of the people that were present to, to make sure that uh, we didn't take anything away from, from what happened that day and we didn't carry it with us back to our families. So uh, I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll wait here for, for you to, to come back. And I sat down on the log. And, uh, the archaeologist uh, said she would wait with me. So while the others were, were gone searching for the medicines, the archaeologist asked me, uh, are you aware? Are you aware of, of a, a gigantic flood that happened, happened in this area about 10,000 years ago? She said, uh, in all of my archaeological work around uh, Gulf Islands and the San Juan and over even over into the mainland, I, I keep finding uh, evidence of, of a flood. And uh, all of the evidence that, that, that I've found all, all points towards a, a time of about 10,000 years ago, she said that, that this flood, great flood happened. And it, uh, it happened everywhere around here. So I told her, uh, I told her we we grew up with that knowledge that, uh, that there was a great flood here. And uh, we were always told that it was around 10,000 years ago to 12,000 years that this flood happened. So then I told her, what I'm going to tell you now about the Great Flood, because she said, uh, "How can I have grown up here in in, in Saanich?" She said, "Gone to gone to high school here in Claremont, gone to university at Uvic, and before I went on to Simon Fraser." She said, "How did I go through all the years of my?" education without ever hearing this. I said that's because uh, 
our history is hidden and it's uh, hidden from the general public because people don't want to acknowledge that we're still here, that we are the rightful owners of the land here. We are the original people. So uh, about 10,000 years ago, our people are uh, living, living here in, on, the, on the Saanich Peninsula on the Gulf Islands. And they were going about their everyday, everyday work. Charles, the creator, came down to our people here in the Saanich, called them together and told them that uh, they must prepare, prepare for a great flood that's coming. He said, you must make great canoes, enough canoes to hold your people and the things that they need to live for, for many, many days. He said, you must find the, the tallest trees, the biggest trees to make these canoes. They must be able to withstand a lot of force. And you must take the the cedar, cedar bark, and make great ropes hundreds of feet long and take them with you in those canoes when the floods come. And he said that you all must be prepared. But you know, in, in those days, just in these days, there are people that, that believe what the Creator says and those that scoff, scoff at what, what's brought to the messages that are brought to them, thinking that these things can't happen. But the, the day did come after they made all their preparations. And uh, of course, uh, some of the people were, were on the sidelines just making fun of them, building their canoes and making their preparations. But when the, 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 the rain started coming in real force and the thunder and lightning storm started coming, and the, the people, the water started rising and the people realized the people realized that the, the flood was was coming so the people that prepared did start to put their things into their canoes and make their preparations preparations and uh, so they got themselves the ones families that got themselves ready got into their canoes and brought all their their belongings that they needed with them and went into their canoes and started paddling paddling out and the water the water around us continued continued to rise all around us and the last thing that they could see of the land was uh was Seowalna, what what is uh known these days as Mount Newton. But our 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 name for that is Thelma. And then uh, that the top of uh Thelma, there's giant arbutus trees right at the right at the top. So our people paddled paddled all their canoes towards towards Thelma, towards the the top and they they saw those giant arbutus trees so they they tied off one end of their their giant ropes off to the giant arbutus trees and they tied the other end off to their canoes and uh, still the water water kept rising and rising and the the top of sail on the disappeared and they were left to, to watch the water rise while their the ropes started to get smaller. Do you know the somehow they knew how long the roof should be because just when they were at the the at what they call the end of their rope, the, the water stopped the water stopped rising. <clears throat> 
and they they stayed up there they stayed up there in that water watching all of the water all around them and watching for for signs and stayed there for for many many days they think maybe a week until uh, a raven came flying across the water and it had a, a branch in its mouth, a branch from the, the arbutus tree. And uh, then they knew that, uh, that the, the land was going to come back. The land was going to return to them. So they waited and sure enough, the water started going down going down and pretty soon they, they could see the the Sandwich Peninsula appearing out of the water. The Chals, the creator came down to them and said uh, this is Hussainich this is Hussainich and it's uh, it's the emerging emerging land. That's what it means. Hussainich emerging land. And you are the Hussainich people. The emerging people. You are the ones that emerged from the flood. So that's that. Now you are the Hussainich people. So that's where. Sanich came from and that's actually where the name Sanich comes from because when the first settlers came here they asked what what is the name of this place and our our people said Sanich and you know since they couldn't pronounce it they called it Sanich so that's that's how this the Sanich here got its name and that's how Hussainich, that's how we became the Hussainich people, the emerging people, because of uh, the great flood and, and how, how we survived it. And we all know that we're all descendants of the people that survived the flood. So we are the Hussainich people. So uh, that is, uh, I just wanted to let you know how that Hussainich came to be and why we are known as the Hussainich nation. So uh, I know it's, it's something that isn't generally known amongst the, the public. And as much as I can as a hereditary chief, I, I feel it's my obligation to, to spread the word about uh, who our people are and educate, uh, educate people as to who we are and why we're here. Thank you. I guess uh, the other um, thing is uh, where we're, we've been having a lot of talks lately about uh, Sydney Island and uh, the little bay that, that's uh, that's uh, the first thing you go into when you go out to Sydney Island. Uh, we call it Stolzaman, uh, Sydney Spit area. Stolzaman is all that that area in there. And Stolzaman is is a is a really uh, important place for us. That uh, Whole of the, the the remnants of one of our old villages there, all along that that uh, that bank there, the remains of our our ancestors are buried all along there. And uh, one of the the things that uh, my uh, grandfather and his brothers. Used to talk about it all the time when they went to, when they went out there was uh, was having to go in there and, and it was a special place for them to get bracken fern and uh, they used bracken fern all of the time when 
when they were doing the reef net fishery, uh, preparing, preparing, uh, preparing the salmon or for whatever they needed to get done. If they used a bracken fern to clean the salmon because uh, that, that, that bracken fern has a special roughness to, to its texture. And they used, they used to clean the outside of the salmon with that. But also uh, they used, uh, used the bracken fern in the pit cooks when they cooked the salmon to, to give it that special flavor. And uh, my, my grandfather's uh, brother, his name was uh, Philip Palkey, was, uh, was telling us uh, one time he went out there and uh, he, he went, uh, he left uh, the family, they were camping along the, the waterfront and he left the family to go down a trail that, that uh, traversed the island and he, he said he knew a special place where he could get the, the best bracken fern. Um, and uh, that, that he was going to go, go and look for it and that he would, uh, he would come back to the family after he had enough for, for their needs. But uh, he, he went off by himself down the island and um, started to, to pick, pick the, the bracken fern. And um, I'm just looking for the the name of the my uh, so my my uh, my great my my grand uncle went along that trail from, from Skullsamen inland. And while he was, uh, was picking the, the, the bracken fern, he said when he turned to go back, go back to, to, to the bay, a monster came out of the bush that was uh, a great, great monster that had been been uh, troubling our people for many years. He said that uh, it came out and it blocked the trail. And uh, my granduncle said he was he was there. He was there with uh, with no weapons or, or nothing. And he was uh, just a teenager at the time. And so he was left there defenseless against this monster that 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 we called Stalicum. It was called Stalicum. And he said he all, all he could do was throw the ferns, throw the ferns at the at the Stalicum, hoping that it would scare it. But uh, he said when the ferns hit the Stalicum, the scales that were on the side of the stalicum stood up like that, stood up, and then, uh, and then they went back down, and he he picked more, more ferns and threw it again. And as soon as the, the, the ferns hit the, the stalicum again, the, the wherever they hit the the scales stood up like that, and. Uh, he said he got uh, he got so scared that he was going to die that he fainted and he he when he woke up he woke up and uh, all he could find was uh, the ferns the ferns that he'd thrown at the stalicum there was no no stalicum there anymore so. Uh, he ran, he ran all the way back, uh, back to the beach to the family, told them 
what had happened. So they they all packed up their their things and uh, left Skullsamen and went back to sail. And uh, so they knew that the the Steelcom was there on uh, Sydney Island. But it wasn't uh, only seen on Sydney Island. It was it was seen uh, on Sandwich Inlet uh, by one or uh, by Sartlet, Sartlet Village, and it was seen out in uh, Pender Island in the Pender Canal, where it, it, uh, they think that it killed many of our people. And it was also seen over at Salt Spring, and there's markings out there of a, a stalactite on a big rock. So they think that maybe that might have been its home up there in the lake up there in Salt Spring Island. So that's uh, that's just something that our 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 granduncle Philip Helke told us about uh, Sydney Island and uh, the family that actually the last family that was living there on Sydney Island is. Is the Josephs and uh, and one one elder elderly lady named Selina Joseph was the last last person to live there, and her family is uh, living here in Seattle now. And uh, I don't know if you know Toby Joseph, but he's a he's a great great grandson of Selina Joseph. So. Uh, that's just uh, something I wanted to share with you about uh, about Sydney Island. I'm not sure if all of you have, have heard of uh, Pakals. Uh, Pakals is uh, now known as uh, as uh, Mount Doug because of Mount Doug Park, and. Um, Around 1852, our people had a, a fishing village in Cadbro Bay, and where they'd go and they they'd live there during the, the fishing season. And uh, not all the families, but some of our families lived there, and they used to have trails, uh, trails between between Cadbro Bay and. Uh, that came out to Saanich and went, some of them went to Cad Cordova Bay, some of them went to, to Sail, Sartlip, Sycam. So they had all these trails that, that, that went back and forth. And most of the trails were used by runners. And those runners were young men that were chosen because of their running skills to run back and forth between the, the villages. To, to bring important messages back and forth. So in 1852, one of our young men was dispatched from, from Cadbro Bay to run and bring a, an important message back to, to Sayout. He was, he was told to uh, bring this important message back and then bring back the response. So this young man was running, running from Cadbro Bay and coming by Mount Doug through, through the Gordon Head area. And uh, along the trail, he came upon a, a wooden split rail fence, I guess they call it, a wooden fence that was erected along the trail, crossing it. And he was uh, standing there looking looking at the at the at the fence because he'd never seen such a thing ever built in the, in the Spanish territory and he was wondering what it was and uh, then he re he recalled that he was uh, supposed to be bringing an important message to to say out so he he jumped over the fence and uh, started to make his way across a field and when he was making his way across the field a, a farmer that was had been watching him at the fence shot him 
shot him and uh, killed him. And uh, the the families that were still in Cadbury Bay heard heard the the shot. Because uh, gunshots in those days were were pretty weird, rare thing and uh, and pretty louder than anything else they'd ever heard before. So they came running, running down the trail from from Cadbury Bay and and came to the fence and then saw the young man laying in the field. So they jumped over the field and. Uh, and uh, went to see him. And then they saw the farmer standing a, a ways away from them with his gun. And I guess he was expecting trouble because he was he was holding the gun on them. But they, they just picked up the young man and carried him, carried him the rest of the way to sail and brought him to the chief's house and sailed and uh, explained to them what they what they had found that the young man they found was dead and that he had uh, something they think that that the farmer had killed him somehow and uh, so they uh, the, the chief hearing that uh, called a meeting amongst all the chiefs of the Senate nation to come together. And uh, at that time, our, our, our nation uh, took in uh, the Sandwich Peninsula over to the Malahat, as far as the Cold Stream, and over the Salt Spring, and then out into the Gulf Islands, and then over into the San Juan Islands and uh, even as far down as Elwha. So all of the chiefs uh, were, were summoned and, and came to this big meeting and sailed. And uh, the chief of sailed explained to them what happened, that uh, one of our young men had been killed for no reason. And uh, that, 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 person was in uh, in that Gordon Head area. So the chiefs had their meeting and they decided that it was now time to, to be rid of the Quinitums. That's what uh, they called everyone that wasn't First Nations. They wasn't one of our people. They called them Quinitums. And uh, Quinitum means just arrived. So that's that's what the, they called everyone, Quinitums. That wasn't one of our people. So they said they decided that it was time to be rid of the Quinitums, that they were a danger to our people. So they, there was a priest in those days living amongst our people. Uh, he was a missionary priest. And... Uh, He'd been amongst the Sanish people for so long that he'd learned the Sanchathan language, which is the language we speak, Sanchathan. So he learned the Sanchathan language from our people. And so the chief called him and, and told him to bring a message back to the chief of the Quinitums that they wanted to meet with him up on Pakal's which is, which is uh, one of our sacred mountains. So Pakal's uh, is the border between the Sanish people and the Kwangan people. And usually all of our important meetings between the Sanish and the Kwangan people took place on Pakal's. So they called a meeting to happen up in the calls and, uh, and called uh, the chief of the Quinitums, which was Sir James Douglas in those days, their governor, called him to that meeting. And uh, so Sir James Douglas, uh, in uh, February 
I don't know, February 3rd or something, 1852, marched up the calls with the battalions of his men, maybe uh, 40 or 50 men, all armed, marched them up to the calls and uh, to meet with the, the chiefs of Slaves Nation. But unbeknownst to them, the Wasanish the chiefs had uh, informed uh, the warriors of the Wasanish Nation to surround the calls. And that uh, when they were going to give them the signal, they were going to attack, attack the Quinitums and uh, kill them all. And then they were going to go down to what was known as Fort Victoria at that time and kill all the people that were there. So uh, they, they got up to the mountain there and all of the chiefs were on one, one side and uh, Sir James Douglas and his his uh, battalion were on the other side. And uh, the warriors were sitting up in the brush waiting for the signal. So before the, the chief could give a signal, the, the missionary priest came out from behind Sir James Douglas. And, and he was carrying a three foot crucifix or cross that he'd made a three foot cross in front of him and he was walking forward towards the chiefs with it. And he was telling them that uh, to, not to kill the Quinitums, not to, to spare them. He said the, the Quinitums are a spiritual people just like you. They believe in the creator and they can't they can't be evil if they believe in, in the creator. And uh, the chief seeing that what, uh, what he was carrying and thought that it somehow remember, re reminded them of uh, the totem poles that our people constructed for ourselves. And they, they thought that there must be some spirituality in it. So they, after hearing what the priest said, they went back and had another meeting, meeting amongst themselves, then came back and uh, told the, the missionary priest to speak for them and tell Sir James Douglas that because they believe that they are spiritual people and that somehow are good a good people that they would spare them, but there should there should be a peace treaty amongst them, between them. A peace treaty that uh, that protected our land and protected our way of life, and that uh, no killings of our people were to happen and that uh, our people were to be treated fairly. So these were the words that were given to Sir James Douglas by, by uh, the missionary priest from the Slimish chiefs. So that's, that's, that's how the, the Douglas Treaty came to be in 1852 because of those, those incidents. And that's, that's, uh, this was told to me up on Pakal's one day when we were fighting to bring back the name of Pakal's. Uh, one of our elders took me up there and told me why Pakal's was so important to us and that uh, they supported the fight to, to reinstate the name. So I was lucky to hear that, uh, hear this right from one of our elders because it, it was uh, passed down, passed down from generation to generation so that our people would know why, why there's a treaty and why Pakals is such a big part of that treaty. So, 
I'm not sure if any of you have any any questions. What? Eric, those were amazing stories. They were all new to me. Thank you so yeah. much for sharing. I'm so grateful to to have that insight into the history of this area. I'm not from here, but I I feel like I understand it that much more now. Yeah. Um, I will now open it up to questions. If anyone has questions, you can either hit the raise hand button down at the bottom of your screen. You can type into the chat. Or if you have your video on, you can turn your video on and give me a wave. Oh, Greg is asking a question. Can Chief Pelkey say if there is news about the efforts to reclaim? Oh, I can't pronounce that. Voltoff. Eric, can you? yes. <laughs> Voltoff is, uh, is the name given that, uh, that we have for what is known as James Island. So Lal Toss is actually uh, the birthplace of, of my great grandfather, Chief Louis Pelkey. So he was born out there on James Island and Lal Toss in 1860. So it, it, uh, that really proves to us that, that our village did exist and that, that it, was, it is one of the, the the, the original villages of our people, but uh, yeah, our uh, our legal efforts, our legal legal efforts, are still going forward um, in regard to reclaiming the Lotas. Our our chief and council, uh, the elected chief and council, do do meet with the the owners of. Uh, Lotas. Um, occasionally, I haven't been uh, any part of that, but uh, um, I'm waiting to give give my evidence when we do do go to court to reclaim Lotas. So it is an action that is still going forward. Okay, I have a question from Catherine. Oh, which is a fantastic question. She says, "Thank you so much for sharing these stories." I grew up at the foot of Pakals, which I believe is Mount Doug for anyone who's not familiar with the settler name, and still live very close. I walk there almost daily. I feel so lucky to now know more about it. How can I be sure to be respectful of such an important place for your people when I'm in the area? Well, one of the, one of the, the main things that people can do to respect Lil Toss is to not disturb the ground not disturb the ground because uh, there there is things under the ground, maybe the remains of our people or the remains of a village. Um, this this area um, around Patal is, is an area where my great 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 grandmother she was uh, she was the mother of uh, of uh, Chief Louis Palkey and uh, she she actually lived there and there's uh, pictures of her um, down on the beach at the foot of McCall's and, uh, and so she spent a lot of a lot of time there. We have also thank you. coming from Jerry. Uh, yes. I saying thank you Eric for such an interesting history lesson. Can you comment on the reclamation of the small island to the northeast of Sydney Island? The Squanum. The Squanum is, uh, is the name that we've just, of the island that we've just reclaimed. Um, part of the Senate uh, Leadership Council's effort. The Squanum is uh, what uh, people formerly knew as Halibut Island. And it is an island that uh, uh, up to this time has uh, been virtually undisturbed by habitation. Uh, there is no one that's ever lived on Halibut Island. And uh, when, from what I've been told that uh, the, the, the plants and the medicines and uh, the resources that are on that island are, are just as they would have been 200 years ago. 
So the, it is a pretty mark, remarkable ecosystem and uh, we're really, really, really happy to have it return to us and, it, and it's going to be a part, a regular part of the, the sale on the tribal schools uh, curriculum to, to go out to the island to, to see what's there and to study what, what's there and how things should be growing. We still have a little bit of time, so don't be shy. We have this incredible opportunity to have this incredible knowledge holder here with us. So we are getting another question. It's from Nathan, Nathan Pesk. Are there other medicines or foods from <laughs> Skatan that were prized other than bracken fern? Yeah, there is there is a many, many um, medicines and foods that, that were utilized by our people from, from Skullstamen. But uh, it was because of the, the fallow deer, um, our, our elders have been telling us that most, most of those things have been decimated because the fallow deer eat everything, everything that, that that could possibly be edible. They've they've eaten it, and now uh, we're we're our efforts are working towards the eradication of the fallow deer so that the natural medicines can come forward, and uh, the we have what is known as the environmental committee of the Spanish Leadership Council that's going to work work with the uh, with the committee with Parks Canada and to try to reinstate all of the native, native plants and medicines that, are, that should be growing out there and that, that might reappear once the, the fallow deer are gone from there. And on that, Nathan, I don't know if you had the chance, we had uh, Nancy Turner and I will kill her name, Selayla Claxton, last time talking about ethnobotany and traditional a plan so it's on our uh, shared Dropbox so I I invite you to go and check it out because it was also a great talk. We have another question and maybe there is time maybe for one extra after this one I don't want to steal too much time of Eric so are there lessons to be learned from the former Halibut Island for Sydney Island? Oh I think there, there can be many lessons learned from there, I think uh, people that, that want to work on the restoration of uh, Sydney Island to, to its natural state can use what's on uh, Susquenum as a, as a lesson of what, what should be growing there and what could be growing there. So I think that that is a, a good place to start that uh, that uh, we the people could work with the Sinish Leadership Council to study what what is out on uh, Susquenum in order to to determine what's actually missing from Sydney Island now. Okay, I'm scanning one more time. I think that is all the questions. I don't see anything else in the chat. And we are just about to wrap up at 1 p.m. So I think we will close it out here. I'm sure if there's any questions that, that come up to people's minds after the fact, you can relay them to us and we will pass them off to Eric. Eric, thank you again so yeah. much. This was this was really a fantastic session. We're also grateful to have been here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I will, as always, we will uh, put the recorded session in the Dropbox and in the G Drive. So it should be there by I usually try and put them up Friday morning or Friday evening, but Monday at the latest. Uh, thank you again, Eric, on behalf of all of us. I will say it in my language. Grazie. <laughs> uh, all right, folks. Uh, Bea and I always stick around for a couple minutes, just in case anyone wants to stick around and ask any questions. Um, but otherwise... Yeah, thank you all again. I hope everyone enjoyed this session, <laughs> well, at least a little bit as much as I did. Thank you all. We have more to come. The series is going on until uh, 
the end of April. So stay tuned. We always like to send a reminder toward Wednesday, Thursday, so that we are fresh in your mind. And um, share the knowledge about this series, share the Dropbox, because we know there are a lot of other people that may not be here. But it's really a good source of information about the beautiful island we are all care about. So, And I've given everyone the chance to unmute themselves in case anyone wants to say anything or ask any questions before they go.